You've got to balance all those constituencies, and that's the negative or the challenge. But the positive is when a public company does something, it does it big, right, in size. So when we finally did something, it was a $250 million acquisition of Bitcoin. And and for me, I was like, I wanted to do $500 million, but $250 million was the compromise. And we agreed to buy back $250 million of our stock at the same time kind of as insurance to, to, to give all of the, 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 the um, shareholders that were concerned about the strategy, give them an exit at a profit. The U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission approved six spot Bitcoin ETFs in January, ushering in a new age for cryptocurrencies and digital assets. MicroStrategy founder and executive chairman Michael Saylor said the SEC's clearance allowed Bitcoin the tools to go from a multi-hundred billion dollar asset to a 10 or 100 trillion dollar one, Saylor believes the approvals influenced U.S. politics because the ETFs showed Wall Street the net industry's potential. The future of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin is unknown, despite their popularity in the U.S. campaign. Former U.S. President and Republican Party candidate Donald Trump committed Saturday at the Libertarian National Convention to help Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies grow in the U.S. if he wins in November. The audience applauded. Trump promised to stop Biden's crypto devastation. I'll track Bitcoin and U.S. dollars. Help 50 million crypto users self-custody. I promised what Bitcoin did's Peter McCormack that I would protect your Bitcoin from Elizabeth Warren and her thugs and never let a central bank control digital money. Saylor warns crypto-skeptic politicians that the wind of change is blowing through Washington and they must join or risk losing a robust company. Once Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies become ubiquitous, Saylor says Wall Street and banks will force Congress to give up. Watch and enjoy the film. So oh, in 2020, uh, we had uh, half of our enterprise was in cash, and it was generating 0% yield. And it was very clear that if, if we wanted to actually um, have the, uh, the success of Wall Street firms, we needed to have an asset. And the asset needed to generate more than the cost of capital. So the search is, to f- and the cost of capital jumped because in an environment where you print 40% more money, all of your assets have to go up in price 40% for you to keep parity, right? And so what did? Well, big tech stock surged, uh, real estate surged. Um, you know, so, so those things do surge. Cash doesn't surge. <laughs> Owning a bunch of dollars, dollars weren't worth 40% more three years later than they were in 2020. So we went on this search and we, and we you know, considered art and real estate and buying the index and buying big tech companies. And there are regulatory uh, considerations that keep you from just buying securities. You can't have more than 40% of your liquid uh, assets in securities if you're a publicly traded company generally. And so you can't just buy $500 million of SPY. But and even if you did, there's then practical consideration, which is if you told all your investors, we just took all this money and invested in the SPY, their response would be, well, there's nothing special about that. That's the most conventional strategy you could pursue. A 12-year-old could do the same, give us the capital back. So we discovered uh, the idea of gold, and then we thought about it. We decided that digital gold would be better than gold. If we could get all the benefits of a non-sovereign store of value bearer instrument that's uh, hard money, and if we could combine it with all the benefits of Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon, a big tech global dominant network, putting the idea of technology investing with the idea of, of hard money investing together in the year 2024, it struck us as being a reasonable strategy. And at the time, it was really the only reasonable strategy. We're, we're either going to give the money back to the shareholders, and that's a fast death. Give the money back, decapitalize, have no assets, right? Once you lose your financial capital, you're going to lose your human capital. Because if you have no money on the balance sheet, and if your business has no volatility, the options have no value, stock options have no value, you can't, afford, you can't overpay the employees, you don't have the cash, and so you're probably going to lose the employees, and then three to six years later, the product's not going to be competitive. So the fast death wasn't all that appealing. If you're going to do that, you might as well just sell the company. Hmm. The slow death is set on $600 million in cash, which you know we could, we could run at an operating loss for 20 years with that much cash, 
but you're just waiting to die, right? It's like, you're not gonna beat Microsoft and Amazon and Facebook and Google. That's like holding up in your citadel while that army's outside. They're just gonna starve you to death. And okay, I've got seven years of food in my citadel, but while I'm sitting here and for seven years, they're gonna burn all my fields, you know? <laughs> damn my water supply and take over the rest of the world. And when I come out in seven years, people will have forgotten me. So that's no good. So the last thing is you go, you ride out of the Citadel, you take a risk, you know, pick sides, join the fray, uh, you know, take a decision. And at the time, you know, the, the obvious uh, team to join was team Bitcoin. <laughs> The obvious movement was the crypto movement, and there was a lot of risk, but, but the alternative was just a, either a slow or fast death. On May 16th, the Senate enacted a carré revoking the SEC's Staff Accounting Bulletin 121, which set strict capital requirements on crypto custodians, making banks' crypto custody problematic. Services, according to Cody Carbone, the Chamber of Digital Commerce's chief policy officer, the White House threatened to veto the resolution and reinstate the SEC's accounting rule before the House voted to repeal SAB 121. After the resolution was sent to Biden's desk last week, the president had 10 days to do one of three things, overturn SAB 121 by veto or do nothing by deadline as the deadline approaches. The cryptocurrency industry awaits Biden's decision, but it's important to remember that the president had promised to veto the resolution to overturn it in a statement sent out on May 8th. H.J. Resolution 109 would invalidate SEC SABE 121, which reflects SEC staff views on certain firms' accounting obligations to safeguard crypto assets. By invoking the Congressional Review Act, it could also limit the SEC's ability to ensure appropriate guardrails and address future crypto asset issues like financial stability. Despite this alarming statement, Saylor believes H.J. Resolution 109 will not be vetoed. Here are additional snippets from his interview. Well, I, I'm the catalyst, yeah. but the difference between uh, an individual investor and a public company is an individual investor can, can think about it, maybe discuss it with a family member or two and make the decision. A private company thinks about it, talks to one major investor, three people in the private company and makes a decision and tells nobody. Hmm. A public company, you would have to you would have to persuade your entire uh, management team, the CFO, the general counsel, the CEO, the head of technology, maybe. Then you have to get the consensus of the directors. So the management, the the, the directors and the officers have to come aligned. Then you have to get consensus from the outside auditor, from the outside counsel, and after you consider those two you have to get consensus of the outside public company investors. And the problem with the investors is at 9.30 in the morning, the investor base turns over, it changes. And by 4 p.m. in the afternoon, you have different investors. So you have to think really hard about how you communicate, telegraph, and build consensus with the investors. And so, so public companies are interesting creatures because on one hand, it, it's like a 19-legged race you know, mm -hmm. uh, fought, you know, or, or something. It's, it's a very intricate uh, dance to build harmony across many constituencies that have asymmetric information and they also have asymmetric priorities, right? The general counsel doesn't want you to get sued, right? The directors have a fiduciary obligation. The outs, you know, there's a set of investors that think one thing, another set of investors that think a different thing. So, You've got to balance all those constituencies, and that's the negative or the challenge. But the positive is when a public company does something, it does it big, right, in size. So when we finally did something, it was a $250 million acquisition of Bitcoin. And, and for me, I was like, I wanted to do $500 million, but $250 million was the compromise. And we agreed to buy back $250 million of our stock at the same time kind of as insurance to, to, to give all of the, 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 the um, shareholders that were concerned about the strategy, give them an exit at a profit. So that was our move. But in retrospect, of course, 250 million was like the largest public purchase of Bitcoin that anybody in the world had ever admitted to or the world had ever seen. I don't, mm. there, there may have been larger uh, public investments or larger investments, but yeah, we don't know about them and they're not credible. <laughs> about right? 12 of them from you. <laughs>
Yeah, and then well, once we did that, <laughs> then we then we were able to do the next one, yeah. the next one, the next one. So public companies are very powerful vehicles if you can align all of your interest. You know, just like countries are powerful. You know, getting a country to get behind Bitcoin <laughs> would be a very powerful idea. It's just you have a lot of constituencies, and so the exercise becomes one in in uh, diplomacy, politics and consideration. Senior Bloomberg ETF analyst Eric posted on social media that a bipartisan group of House lawmakers wrote a letter to CC Chair Gary Jindler urging the commission to approve spot Ethereum ETFs and other digital assets because they offer investors regulated, transparent, and safe crypto access. The letter authorizes spot Bitcoin exchange traded products. ETP represents a pivotal moment for both digital assets and our financial markets, and we urge the commission to maintain a consistent and equitable approach when reviewing upcoming applications for other digital asset-backed ETPs. Specifically, the commission should apply the same principles set forth in the approval of spot Bitcoin ETPs as it evaluates the pending Ether ETP applications. Eric notes that the letter mentions other digital assets besides Ethereum, suggesting that the ETF industry is going all in on cryptocurrency ETFs. This fits with Saylor predictions that other cryptocurrencies and digital assets will share the spotlight with Bitcoin in mainstream markets, though a Bitcoin maximalist says this will strengthen Bitcoin's place in the financial market and greatly benefit the digital asset space. Please leave your comments on Michael Saylor's interview below, like this video, subscribe to the channel, and switch on post notifications for more videos like this. Thanks for